So let's get this recording on the road. All right. So, hello and welcome to the Flights of Fancy podcast, the podcast where we talk about combat and military aviation, past, present, and maybe future, depending on where we are in in history. Uh, with you, as always, is me, your host, Mr. O, and my co-host, Mr. X. We yep, are... It's me. Today, we're going to be talking about the Ferry Company, but more specifically, the Ferry Fulmar. A World War II uh, fighter aircraft, but also kind of reconnaissance and escort. It's kind of a, it fits a weird position in, in history, um, specifically with the uh, United Kingdom uh, and its naval carrier force. Now, ooh, excuse me, uh, like with the last episode, uh, since it's the first time that we're talking about a ferry aircraft, it's going to be particularly useful for us to explore uh, the ferry business and how things uh, developed and how we get to the ferry full of Mars specifically. So uh, without further ado, uh, let's talk about the Ferry Aviation Company, uh, otherwise simply known as Ferry. Um, it has that moniker attached to most, if not all, of its planes it's ever designed. And it was created in 1950, uh, 1915 excuse me, by Charles Richard Ferry and Ernest Oscar Tips, uh, following their departure from the Short Brothers Company, uh, also in aviation and also a company that we'll uh, eventually talk about in the sometime far away future. And as a common theme, uh, they produce designs under licenses or as a subcontractor for other manufacturers. Um, this is fairly typical of companies, as mentioned with uh, Breda, uh, ferry is uh, when you're starting out in the aviation business, unless you already have a design um, or have a lot of money, uh, you're not typically going to be uh, designing aircraft right away and having that stuff uh, sort of ready to go and out the door and flying. Now, uh, after 1915, uh, you see a change in how they operate and and how they uh, how they develop things, namely. In 1917, specifically in February, uh, they produced the Ferry Campania. Uh, it's a aircraft that ends up designed to be used on aircraft carriers. Um, there are mentions here and there that it, the Ferry Campania is the first natively designed uh, aircraft by Ferry, but uh, I've also seen that claim uh, accompanying uh, one or two other designs. So where the truth in it uh, all is is uh, hard for me to say at this moment. However, uh, they the ferry company itself, uh, despite having uh, a fairly early start, 1917 is rather early compared to uh, a couple of the companies, um, and having a good foothold uh, with a successful design for the UK and specifically the Navy, um, we can see that they have uh, several designs and survive multiple decades into the future. Um, but despite such a success, uh, Ferry never becomes a major company. Um, there's sort of, I guess, three points that you'll find as many different aircraft companies or aviation companies within. Uh, you're either a very small player, you make a couple good designs, but they never truly branch out in a way that makes you ubiquitous. You've got some middling companies, which Ferry would, I would associate with. Um, they have a number of designs. They all do, they either do well or not quite so. Um, and they keep themselves in business just by smart moves, um, good decision making, for the most part anyways. Uh, and eventually you have the mega corporations, um, companies that, are around for so long and, well, they, they get some storied histories uh, from time to time. Now, uh, with regards to the Ferry Company, um, we have, again, Mr. Uh, Charles Richard Ferry and Ernest Oscar Tips. Um, Mr. Ferry, born in 1887, uh, around May, had a skill for designing and building model aircraft. Uh, 
Um, he proved his abilities in such a field by winning at least one prestigious competition at the Crystal Palace in London uh, for longest flight and stability. Uh, I believe this is around 1908. Um, a year later, uh, after that, he finds himself as a, a general manager with Blair Athol Syndicate Limited, uh, an aviation company uh, which was formed uh, specifically for the development of a tailless L aircraft by a designer by the name of J.W. Dune. Now, several years pass. Uh, he's getting uh, more experience within the aeronautical field, and by 1913, he manages to... Uh, find himself as a chief engineer with the Short Brothers. Um, again, Short Brothers, uh, we'll talk about in a future episode. Um, they, in in the same sorts of respects as Ferry is, in my view, considered a middling company, Short kind of fits into that same mold. They're never a company that truly breaks out and becomes uh, a world leader in aviation, um, but they're certainly not one that... Uh, that started, had a design or two, and then kind of shifted off into obscurity. Um, when war breaks out in uh, 1914, uh, Mr. Ferry actually tries to volunteer to join the um, the RNA, RNAS uh, and the RAF, basically both uh, types of... Um, of air forces available for uh, the United Kingdom at the time, uh, namely the Royal Navy Air Service and the Royal Air Force. Um, unfortunately, or I guess fortunately for our story, uh, he was declined on both occasions. Um, they mention unspecified medical grounds, that's what the Wikipedia brings up, but I don't really have any other better source, unfortunately. Uh, and there's also a mention for his skills as an aeronautical engineer, which makes sense. if people know you as being, or if you declare yourself as a chief designer with Short Brothers, there's no real sense to send you into the trenches so that you can just die on the ground. Um, as for Mr. Tips, uh, he was born in 1893 and happened to be quite active in the engineering field um, due to his family. His family seems to be a group of uh, builders, designers, um, very much into the mechanical side of how things function. Um, by the age of 15, he finds himself actually building an aircraft with his brother Maurice. Uh, the aircraft is built by the, the two of them. There's, I don't believe there's any surviving photo of the aircraft, but it also happens to be a, um, I believe it's a, a canard type aircraft, which at the time is fairly forward thinking. You don't really see that sort of uh, design um, in in the 1910s. Um, as well for him, uh, at the start of uh, World War I, uh, while he doesn't try to enlist, uh, being a man born in Belgium, he does have to leave the country uh, for safety. So he gets evacuated to Britain, uh, and he too finds himself um, in uh, working for Short Brothers. Uh, he continues to develop his abilities with uh, within the aeronautical, aeronautical engineering field. And uh, around the time of the 1917, he, along with uh, Mr. Ferry, to build their own company. They both leave Short Brothers together, um, and Mr. Ferry becomes the owner, the CEO, whereas Mr. Tips... Uh, basically becomes a right-hand man. Um, there's not much that that really gets spoken about these two. Um, unfortunately, I don't own it. I don't know if they even have any biographies or autobiographies uh, for the two men. Um, the next major mention uh, ends up being in, uh, or for Mr. Tips anyways, is that in 1931, he goes back to Belgium, uh, and this is specifically to open an office uh, for Ferry which actually becomes a very interesting offshoot because uh, Ferry actually has a large hold on uh, the Lowlands development of aviation. Um, as we go further into the podcast and we, we cover more and more topics, um, hopefully you'll get to see just how prevalent that is. 
Um, whereas you have, say, uh, France has their own nationalized uh, companies. Germany is obviously doing its own thing, especially by, 19, by the 1930s. Um, but you have uh, the Netherlands, Belgium. Those companies don't necessarily have their own in-house major companies except for ferry in Belgium. So anyways, all to say that um, it becomes a, a, a very important part of uh, the nation's aviation history. Now, uh, the ferry company eventually merges with uh, Westland Aircraft and in sometime in 1960, uh, in 1960 specifically, sorry, uh, they cease production of aircraft. Um, Again, Ferry ends up just not having the sorts of designs or means of competing with some other companies. So, as one might imagine, they uh, they end up merging uh, with other divisions. Uh, the Belgian division uh, gets bought out by, I believe, the the by the government itself uh, in the late seventies. There's a company, uh, an offshoot company in Ferry Aviation of Canada, uh, which gets acquired by IMP Group International. There's another subset called a uh, Ferry Aviation Company of Australasia, uh, PTY, I always forget what it is, Limited, uh, which itself gets merged into AWA Defense Industries of Australia. And uh, on top of that, uh, Ferry also had a separate wing, um, I guess, or division of its company that was specifically for aerial survey. Uh, and that group gets bought out by... Uh, one Blom Aerofield, so B-L-O-M uh, Aero Films. Now, um, one thing that you don't quite find with the Breda company that we saw or that we spoke about in the last episode uh, lies with the speciali specialization that uh, some companies enjoyed. Uh, to be more specific, you end up having companies that do very well at one particular thing. And you can kind of see that specialization uh, from time to time. Um, and Ferry is a really good example of this. So the one thing, one reason why a company would want to do that in the first place is that uh, if you become the main supplier of an aircraft or a type of aircraft, or you become known uh, for that type of aircraft, you end up building, well, obviously there's a history, there's a repertoire that people can look for, and it stands to reason that not only do you have a pedigree in that, especially if you if your designs do well, um, but you you have militaries that will constantly go back to the watering hole, so to speak, to see if you've come up with anything new or revolutionary, and that in and of itself becomes uh, rather important for companies like Ferry that kind of subsist on that specialization itself. Now, uh, when it comes to um, this sort of specialization, you have these companies that are vying for uh, contracts and so on. We can see that sometimes um, but these are, uh, sorry, on the screen we have some uh, examples of aircraft that you would see uh, in Belgium. So stuff like the Ferry Flycatcher, Ferry Fox, these are early designs uh, for the Ferry Company. But um, we can see that you have some companies that develop a reputation for themselves, and maybe those reputations aren't so good. Or just because of lobbying forces, there's no real alternative. A company like Ferry back in the 1920s or 30s was that sort of alternative. If your bigger company doesn't really perform well or has a problem with one of its designs, you can go to the smaller guy. They have they will or should have something um, that they can uh, design or put on the drawing board and maybe steer your nation's military in, in a more... Um, safe direction. Um, now, speaking of uh, reputations and so on, uh, Ferry, since the success of its first seaplanes, um, because while they were made for aircraft carriers, the idea of an aircraft carrier back in the 1910s is a little different than what they would be eventually become. Um, you have aircraft carriers sometimes uh, is more about 
seaplanes versus uh, actual like fighter aircraft that launch and get retrieved on aircraft carriers. But that's also very mm-hmm. minimal and was kind of quickly shooed away. The, the aircraft carriers in that sense became aircraft tenders. Um, but again... It gets like, complicated. Um, and the first person to land successfully on a aircraft carrier, like an actual decked over ship, one day went out the next day and on his third landing he got the dubious honor of being the first person to die trying to land on an aircraft carrier because well it's the hms furious and they didn't have a deck on the rear so they had to send it back to the shipyards because that was absurd in practice <laughs> like really absurd i mean britain's at the forefront of this they've got a decent amount of uh aircraft carriers and seaplane tenders and all sorts of things a few fast packet steamers uh the first aircraft carrier to be lost in combat i believe was the uh hms ben my shri which is named in manx because it it was made for fast mail runs to the isle of man mm-hmm. and all of these planes are kind of debatable they have a very limited supply of ships which are basically the three large light cruisers that could theoretically be turned into a decent flat deck carrier on short notice and carry high perf- high performance high strung planes mm-hmm. like stop with camels right and when it comes to uh the 1910s you don't necessarily have the same sort of uh, outlook on safety or otherwise uh technological understanding for not only uh having planes get off a ship safely stuff like going into into headwinds and what should be your optimal speed and stuff like speeds just in general you don't have that sort of power available um, in those earlier aircraft so um, again going back to uh, ferry specifically their reputation again ends up being naval aircraft in some in one form or or another Uh, whether that's a fighter a search and rescue like well not specifically search and rescue because that's kind of that's a designation that kind of gets added later but uh, you have those sorts of aircraft that fall within a naval category um you you kind of know ferry automatically if you've heard of a couple of either uh interesting events or a couple exciting movies Uh, Namely, The Hunt for the Bismarck. Everybody knows of the Swordfish. Well, the Swordfish is a fairy aircraft. And you can kind of imagine what the success of such a plane could do to your reputation. The Swordfish was so good, in fact, that you kind of never really hear about other aircraft. So that's why uh, it kind of ends up being exciting to talk about stuff like the Fulmar and what have you. But... Uh, not only is the ferry uh, company known for the swordfish, but there's also the Ferry 3, um, which is one of their, uh, I believe, one of the largest uh, contracts that they that they started out with. Um, you have stuff like the Ferry Barracuda, which will, uh, like the Ferry 3 and Swordfish, get future episodes on them as well. Uh, and, again, gets us back to the Ferry Fulmar specifically. Now, to talk about the Ferry Fulmar, you have to cover a couple of extra topics namely the method in which the uk procured aircraft um there's a couple of ways of doing this in the world uh you can either put out a specification which is what the uk generally did you put out a specification that says uh, to all parties interested we have a need for an aircraft that can go 200 kilometers an hour as a max speed it needs to be able to carry a crew of two its main job is going to be say reconnaissance uh if it can carry bombs that's a plus if it does not not so not so big a deal um the wings need to be of a certain type etc etc you're basically just laying the groundworks for what you believe is the best um your desired uh um project so uh the for the uk specifically you have what's called the air ministry and uh 
1917, they're the ones who would issue a what's called a specification file uh, that goes out to, again, to all the aircraft manufacturers uh, within the UK. I don't believe the specifications were ever available to outside companies. Um, I'm not 100% sure on that, but it would make sense that that wouldn't be the case so that you don't have, say, a foreign power that's able to compete against a local business that in the event that you end up fighting them, well, now you can't get spare parts or new vehicles altogether. Um, each of these specifications gets created and is based on a, what's called operation requirements or ORs. Um, so you typically see those as, as just being, it's usually just gets shortened to those two initials. Um, and these are derived by the various needs of the military arm or subset thereof that would be using it. So for example, it wouldn't make sense for the uh, RAF to ask for a carrier fighter because that would be a Royal Navy uh, requirement. And the same applies for something that might be, for example, for Army cooperation. That's something that uh, you kind of have a close fit or close ties between the Army and the RAF to try and, and get something that works uh, to the best of everybody's needs. So, uh, again, you have stuff, uh, another example of, say, a, what a, speci a specification would want is, say, uh, a Merlin engine fighter has to have a minimum of four forward firing machine guns of 3.03 or 0 .303 caliber, um, capable of achieving top speed of 300 kilometers to be launched from aircraft carriers and land on same. My wording obviously is going to be a little different of what the official specifications are, but that's basically the gist of how it's going to, it applies. Um, on top of that, the specifications, uh, two of which, two examples of which we can see here, kind of list out how you can understand the shorthand of uh, each specification. So, for example, uh, in the top left, we have the Hawker Hurricane variant. Uh, to the specification F.37 slash 35. Um, basically, this would turn out to be the uh, Hawker Mark IV uh, D, I believe. Um, in any case, basically what it means is that you have uh, your F stands for fighter. The first number is going to be the request number, and the second number is going to be the year in, uh, in which such a request was made. So in the example in the top left, it is a fighter. It is the 37th request of the year of 1935. Uh, now, generally, that's how that works. I think there's a couple edge cases. We're not going to pay attention to them just because they kind of throw things uh, for a loop. But generally, that's how it works. Uh, for the bottom right, that's, I mean, that's cl very close to what the fairy Fulmar is going to look like. And again, that basically spells out it's a fighter it is the 18th request made in 1940 for such um and, and not even specifically for fighters alone uh they typically all just shared um that that number so it is just the 18th request made by the air ministry and it happens to be for fighters um now Thankfully, that's cleared up, so we can get to the Fairy Fulmar. Um, drawings for the Fulmar kind of revolve around the Fairy Battle. We have a nice comparison here, and you can very much see how the lines are borrowed from each other. Um, to give a very brief overview of the Fairy Battle, uh, it was a multi-crew uh, light bomber um, developed in, I believe, 1934-ish. Uh, might actually have been before. Regardless, the Ferry Battle was an aircraft that was used during the opening stages of World War II, namely in France, and to disastrous effect. We can you can kind of get an idea, um, a little bit anyways, of just what the aircraft is and how it's sort of lacking in say defensive armament. It's not. It doesn't look like a particularly tough aircraft either so that's not really helping it when uh, when it comes to combat but regardless uh, getting to the actual comparisons between the two you can see that they have again the same lines um, there's a couple of visual differences but they're very minor uh, you can see uh, 
say the the chin of the aircraft is a little different uh, how the radiator looks is also very different uh, so it doesn't um, it, it gets a little tough to, to determine the two also uh, at least with this fairy battle it doesn't have a prop spinner which I'm not entirely sure why whereas this one does um, but thankfully the p4 slash 34 is just a prototype and doesn't really see uh, much of any service um, after it's tested. However, it does serve as a, a guideline or premise for the Ferry Fulmar. Uh, here we can see a couple of uh, good comparisons between the Ferry Battle, which we've seen prior, uh, and what the Fulmars end up looking like. Uh, and again, like with the the P434 in the last slide and uh, the Fairy Battle, Fairy has a tendency to copy itself. It just kind of upgrades them a little bit. Now, the Fairy, uh, the Fulmar ends up being uh, slightly smaller than the Battle. Uh, uh, sadly, it's hard to really get ratios correct as, you know, getting them uh, all lined up is... Uh, sometimes a little bit of a chore. We can see that the ratios between these two aircraft are not exactly 100%, but the effect is there, at least in, in general. Um, we can see that uh, one of the major differences just being the nose and how uh, the chin is just a little bit bigger. The nose is a little bit more pointed, um, and more specifically, the rear of the canopy uh, ends up being a little bit more obvious. Uh, there's also in if you want to be able to really tell between a Fulmar and a Battle, uh, your biggest identifier is going to be this giant slab that actually divides the um, the front cockpit with uh, the rear station. Um, also, keeping in line with uh, the previous podcast, uh, something I had forgotten was that. Uh, the name specifically, uh, greenhouse canopy. So greenhouse framing is typically what you would call this, where there's just a lot of different uh, windows uh, or a lot of glass. And um, the framing of such is not quite so great. It kind of, it, while not a major hindrance, it does hinder your view in a lot of different ways. Um, but uh, getting back to the Fulmar's general specs, we're typically looking at a two-man crew uh, because it was designed not only as a fighter but also as a reconnaissance aircraft. Um, it carries uh, between eight and four machine guns. These are typically in uh, 303 caliber or 50 caliber guns respectively. So if it's eight, it's the lower caliber. If it's four, it's the higher ones. Um, the prototype of the Frey Fulmar flies with a Rolls-Royce Merlin 3, which is rated for 1,080 horsepower and tops its max speed at about 370 kilometers an hour. Um, at the time that that was being tested, roughly around 1938, 1939, uh, it is not really a good performance. And uh, we can kind of you can kind of get a good idea as to how the Ferry Fulmar will perform uh, as we get into a couple more slides later on. Um, later on, the Fulmar gets a new engine, specifically the Merlin uh, 8. It's in, it gets a couple improvements to the overall shape of the airframe. Um, sadly, these details are a little too minor for being able to point out. Uh, we're talking about changes, changing the curving of, uh, of the airframe a little bit. Uh, eliminating, uh, you know, a couple extra lines, making sure that your rivets are flush versus uh, any that might stand out, and so on and so forth. Um, one of the big differences that uh, that you can see, um, well, one will be the engine, uh, but when it comes to the, uh, the two different marks, um, one of the bigger identifiers will be this chin, uh, which we'll talk about just a little bit later. Um, these improvements, uh, the Merlin engine and the, the changes to, to the overall shape, uh, give an increase of about 56 kilometers an hour. 
no small feat, to be honest. Um, and which renders the Fulmar able to fly at about 426 kilometers an hour at about 2,300 meters. Um, I I don't do my conversions in, in feet, but so sorry viewers, but uh, not, not terrible, basically. Um, Ferry finds itself in an advantageous position as the, um, the fleet air arm, which is basically what the Royal Navy Air Service renames itself, uh, after a few years, I believe, um, because they are in 1938 to 1940, they're desperate. They don't really have a modern fighter to, to use, um, carrier fighter design kind of stagnated for a little bit um, and didn't immediately catch up to land aircraft. Uh, namely, the if you see stuff like the Hawker Hurricane, the Supermarine Spitfire, the BF-109, all of these examples are monoplanes. And that sort of development was a little bit slower for the Navy. I'm not entirely sure why. It might just be uh, for safety reasons, or they didn't see a need to upgrade right away. But when war comes knocking at your door, you definitely want more and better modern equipment. So, so I wouldn't be surprised if the biplane stuck around for a bit longer because of low speed handling concerns. That's certainly the case for the U.S. with them holding out the F-3F and wildcats first version was a biplane yes it's true you heard it on the internet uh yeah it that's why it lost to the buffalo because it was still holding on to trying to be a biplane that's yeah that actually, some other design features yeah that's actually a really good point um you definitely want to make sure that you your low speed handling because you're landing on an aircraft carrier uh which is a no small feat in any uh, year, really, um, is definitely something you want to uh, to be able to focus on. Um, so, again, Ferry finds itself in a good position. The, uh, the Air Ministry knows about Ferry. They have a design document that's basically drawn up for them. Like, oh, I don't want to say specifically for them, but it's in their, re their wheelhouse. And so... Ferry finds itself uh, also with the construction ability. So it's not even just about we can develop a, uh, a new aircraft and it'll be really good. It's this is similar to it's similar in shape and look to your fairy battle. They the company is already producing those. It won't be all that hard when when you look at the comparisons between the two. It's not all that hard to convert or uh, change your production from the ferry battle to say the ferry full mark so that's working all in their favor now that being said it does take a little bit for production to ever catch up it's nice and all to say that yes we will build the newest greatest and latest thing in a week but your production will always have some sort of delay. Getting your, your factories trained, your your well, your workers trained, your factories built, everything running smooth and so on does take time. So while the specification for the Ferry Fulmar, um, otherwise uh, known as the 0.8 slash 38, because it was in 1938, while that comes out in that year, the first Fulmar doesn't actually take flight until 1940, January, which is uh, not exactly speedy. But in their defense, uh, designing aircraft quickly is not exactly something uh, that happens to a lot of companies, uh, and certainly not with any ease. So the Ferry Fulmar, while it does finally manage to get in the air in the 1940s, it does fill a niche. It's never quite a popular aircraft. Um, it did manage to perform its role in the war, but never to a degree that really saw the Fulmar stand out amongst the crowd. Um, there's a number of aircraft that people could point to that will handily trump uh, a Fulmar 1 or Mark 2. But uh, to get into uh, at least a, 
to get into it at least we'll see there's a couple of uh, major points as to why if uh, fulmar just doesn't do well um in this uh, diagram one of the more telling points is that the fulmar is a fighter and it carries two people and that's kind of one of the death knells of any fighter uh, it's less of a concern in the jet a era but uh, we're not there yet 1940 finds itself with some aircraft that just don't have the power plants to get them at a high enough speed with a certain amount of weight and that was certainly the case for the Fulmar uh, Mark 1 and Mark 2. Uh, here I just really like uh, this image of a, uh, a Merlin engine. I believe it's a Merlin 3. Uh, just kind of showing you how uh, complex these uh, these machines are. Um, having stuff like a variable, variable pitch air screw that uh, with all your different oil uh, oil links, how all the gas works and so on. Uh, just very, very interesting stuff. Um, but getting to the, the Fulmar uh, once more, the overall designs uh, where, whereas the Fulmar Mark I gets that Merlin 8 that I was talking about with 1,030 horsepower, your Fulmar Mark II, uh, which comes out in, I believe, somewhere around 1941, uh, it comes out with almost 300 horsepower more. The empty weights are just about the same. Uh, the takeoff weight or maximum weight, I've heard the term interchanged uh, enough times to, to mess with me. Um, Again, not all that different. Uh, 400 pounds, or well, 600 pounds, not so bad. Uh, the design basically stays the same in terms of size, and we can see that there's a, uh, a small increase to speed. 16 miles per hour is not bad whatsoever. Uh, there's, you know, 50 miles difference. Again, not all that, all that, uh, all that critical. Uh, but once more, getting into the uh, the actual plane itself. Uh, or the the visual portion of it, we can see here on the um, underneath the chin of the aircraft uh, where the air intake is for your radiator. This is actually one of the biggest parts uh, to tell between a Mark One and a Mark Two. Um, as far as I'm aware, there might be I think there's one other difference, uh, but generally speaking, if you've got two small intakes uh, on one on either side of the actual radiator air intake, that's your defining factor between a Mark I and a Mark II. Um, the only other way to really tell between a Mark I and a Mark II would be uh, a couple specialist rolls, which we'll see uh, a little bit later. So uh, once more with regards to the, uh, the Mark II, we can see this one is a Mark II because of the radiator intakes. Um, but this one, and this is very hard to see, unfortunately, this is probably the only photo I can find anywhere. Um, but the Fulmar Mark II was actually converted uh, later in its lifetime into a night fighter variant. Um, you can tell just because of this stub. This stub basically has a, uh, a few aerials that jut out, which I'm now basically just drawing over. Um, but these aerials basically act as a radar. Um, there's a couple more here. It's a little tough to spot. And there's, I believe, generally one more around here-ish. Um, but basically it does what you would what you would think of as a night fighter. Um, that basically relays information to a screen, which your uh, your second crewman is looking at and that crewman then relates the information to the cockpit so that he can search for them. Um, and a bottom of the page, we get a good idea of what uh, a full Mar aircraft looks like on an aircraft carrier, because after all aircraft carriers have a, are a very, uh, are very limited in space and you need to be able to design your aircraft to have such a, a folding design so that you can cram as many as you can in said aircraft. Um, there is a couple other interesting po uh, points to the, um, and specifically to uh, British aircraft and the Fulmar itself, uh, but 
Every once in a while, if you ever get the chance, especially in color photos, you'll note that near the weapons, uh, in this example of a uh, Fulmar uh, Mark I, does not have uh, the radiator intakes, but this Fulmar Mark I, uh, we can see it's got a nice little dark area here. Um, in a plan view, it looks more like a rectangle, but regardless, um, basically, that's a visual identifier of where the guns are on uh, on the plane itself. Um, there's actually a really interesting tidbit in the in the fact that uh, you can typically see those areas in one of two ways. You will either have the ability to, to see uh, each hole that corresponds to the machine guns, or you see nothing. It is just a flat surface. Now. You might wonder why that would be. What exactly would make it so that um, in one instance you can see the weaponry that the vehicle has and in the other you don't? Is it because the guns have been taken off? Is there some sort of uh, opening or closing port? And the reason is that it's actually tape. So what the, um, what the, Royal Air Force noticed was that if they actually put a form of tape, uh, I, unless it was fabric, but I'm pretty sure it was tape. Anyways, if they covered up those holes, you actually see an increase in performance. We're not talking about anything huge here, maybe about five kilometers an hour at the highest speed, maybe. It also depends on how many holes there are that you're blocking, but it's a performance boost nonetheless. And if you're trying to get every last horsepower into uh, into gaining speed, small little changes like that to your design, or that can be modified on the cheap, those, if that causes you to down one more enemy plane, then frankly, it's probably just worth it. Um, there's a couple interesting uh, things here on this slide, just with uh, the one of the manuals that was able to find on the aircraft. Um, notably the uh, the maximum speeds. Now I'm not good at converting knots to um, to kilometers an hour or miles per hour, uh, but it does give you an idea as to how quickly you can go uh, with say flaps down or the undercarriage down. Um, going anything over those typically will damage, likely permanently. Uh, either of those devices. And in a dive, it's more just that's your max speed and exceeding it either gets you in an uncontrolled uh, dive that you can no longer recover from or your plane just starts disintegrating, one or the other. Uh, we can also see that uh, there's a fairly interesting note here uh, with regards to the Fulmar. Namely, it was able to carry bombs. We can see uh, the, um, the underwing mounts here. And uh, those bombs, um, well, you can also carry an auxiliary tank, uh, or if, and again, in this note, if a bomb is being carried, um, it can be catapulted or accelerated, uh, but you have to be careful with it, because if you don't, you kind of lose your aircraft. That's not good. Incid incidentally, how large are said bombs? Uh, the bombs were, uh, I believe, 100 kilograms um, and up to 250. So nothing nothing huge. Uh, it's more... Yeah, it's still nothing to sneeze about. The uh, Wildcat had provision on the uh, Dash 3. They got rid of it later for 200-pounder bombs. Mm -hmm. Basically, the idea was the escort for a raid would go in first and if they didn't run into cap they'd suppress enemy air defenses with strafing and 200 pound bombs mm -hmm. they took them to the lay salamalo grade which was a good thing because they realized that they really weren't worth bothering carrying even when they weren't going to run into enemy planes and they got that out of their system before coral sea <laughs> and the other problem too especially um, affecting not only the Fulmar, but also uh, the Wildcat and a couple other designs is uh, when you have those mounts, um, that's a permanent increase to uh, your, your or decrease to your airspeed. Those, they stick out awkwardly in a way that disrupts how you would think a plane is. When you think of a plane, it's always a very slick appearance. 
Um, the curves are, I don't want to say natural, but they're purposeful. You don't ever think of a plane as being um, like a crumpled piece of paper. It's always a more of a flat piece of paper. And that sort of uh, dictates why uh, certain developments are dropped in the case of uh, if a plane had the ability to carry bombs and then doesn't. Um, here is just a, a nice photo of uh, what a Fairy Fulmar would actually look like on an aircraft carrier. Uh, there's, I think, one video I can find online um, from Pathy, which is a, they're a rather nice group for the videos, um, but it's kind of a mess trying to get them, and uh, I, I'm not going to mess around with copyright laws on, on that front. Um, but the Fulmar in action actually looks rather comfortable to take off from an aircraft. Um, or aircraft carrier. Uh, the Again, the only video I've ever seen of it, actually just like, it, it kind of just floats upwards. It's actually really nice to see. Um, compared to uh, what I've typically seen on aircraft carriers or aircraft on aircraft carriers, where uh, they typically make it to the end of the runway, fall off uh, not very gracefully, uh, dip down, and then pull themselves up into the air. So, if anything, I, I guess that's points to the Fulmar in, in that respect. Um, talking uh, a little bit about uh, at least the, the Pacific, um, it's handy to know that the Fulmar actually operated in every theater. Um, whether that's a consequence of need versus want is... Uh, probably something you can figure out, uh, especially when we start doing com um, comparisons with other aircraft. Uh, but it served in the Atlantic, it served in the Mediterranean, the Indian, Indian Ocean, and the Pacific Ocean. And uh, while it wasn't, again, always the best, it was something that was available. And hey, if anything, the Fulmar does earn a credit in helping to track down the Bismarck. And when it comes to comparisons, um, I don't want to say we're going to cheat a little bit, but uh, we'll use the ferry, the Fulmar Mark II, because it was the more powerful of the two aircraft. And let's compare it against one of its natural predators, so to speak, um, the A6, A uh, A6M0. Now, uh, this will give, a, a again, a good idea as to um, the, the, the problems inherent in a Fulmar Mark one or two, um, more or less just the design itself. Uh, the A6M is basically a small aircraft in all respects. Uh, its wingspan is slightly shorter, um, seven feet. Uh, the length is uh, miles uh, in, in terms of difference. Um, 10 feet is nothing to shrug at uh, versus wing size. Um, and that's a lot of that length is going to be due to that second cockpit that the Fulmar needs in order to even perform its duties. Um, while the uh, A6M carries a, an engine that is uh, 400 horsepower less, it does have almost half of the empty weight, which is stunning. Um, and really more of a testament to the A6M than uh, something that, that uh, really shows off how or the design for the Fulmar Mark II is. However, it still is a valid comparison. Uh, maximum speed of the Zero being 60 miles per hour uh, higher, the range being different, the service ceilings being higher. Um, these are all points to, to as to why the Fulmar is not a popular uh, or a more well-known aircraft. Um, and it stands to reason as well that this is why you, uh, I'm not making a comparison against um, land-based aircraft because while I could pick any of the Spitfires, um, the problem inherent in an aircraft or a carrier fighter is that it will never truly compete against a land-based fighter. Um, this isn't to say that land-based fighters are inherently always going to be better but they don't have to carry the same sorts of uh, equipment or even design features that you would find on a carrier fighter because they don't need to. You just go land on 
uh, on an airfield on the ground somewhere. Um, yeah, there's all, and there's a good amount of stuff that you get. Like the American carrier fighters, at least until the F4U, had a the pilot perched up high and forward, which was good for sight lines, good for deflection shooting, incidentally. But the really big thing was it just meant that he, the pilot had a much better view over the big engine. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be. And until they figured things out with the F4U, that wasn't a viable carrier fighter because they didn't have a good way to let the guy see the ship that he's landing on. I've heard that this is important. <laughs> kind of want to see the thing you're trying to land on. Uh, we, and also just straight up adding toughness because a carrier landing is to some degree slamming the thing down on the deck hard enough that the wire catches and it drags the plane to a halt. Not any of that silly business where you kind of fly down, touch down on your wheels. Now you just kind of slam it down into the deck. <laughs> Yeah, that's why you sometimes, like, the more notable videos on carrier landings will typically show, uh, at least for uh, World War II uh, aircraft, you'll typically see, like, the wheel pop off, the tail just, like, snaps in two, those sorts of things. Because, as you said, the uh, the structural integrity required to for a, a carrier fighter is going to be higher than a land-based fighter in, in any respect. Um, and speaking of sight lines, this, I, I, I wasn't thinking about it at the time, but this actually gives a, a good view as to, um, as to what those sorts of problems would be. Um, while not necessarily as prevalent in say the Spitfire, you do have to worry about, uh, this entire area that is being covered by your wings. Um, whereas having, uh, at least in the, the F4F, uh, it's got a lot of, it's, it's wings are stubbier. Uh, they don't take as much surface area, um, and because the pilot is relatively higher, um, although with its with the wings a little bit higher on the on the groom, and it kind of negates itself. But uh, the position of the pilot does become, like you said, a very important factor on uh, sight lines and how you're going to land. Um, if you go back to our previous episode with the Breda uh, BA sixty four and sixty five, uh, having the pilot at the utmost front of the aircraft also uh, was something that really gave them uh, better sight lines on, uh, on approaching your target or landing those sorts of things um, getting back to the performance however uh, we can see that uh, maximum speed for the f4f4 and the seafire 2c they're both higher than the full marmar 2 uh, the range is comparable uh, i believe the seafire is a little bit worse but it's hard to really um it's hard to really fault uh, the fulmar in the sense that it was fulfilling a duty whereas uh the sea fire comes after the fulmar it's got a better pedigree because it's built off of a arguably better design and so on and you can see that again with the stuff like the takeoff weight the empty weights um that's what happens when you don't have to worry about uh a second cockpit you know you don't have to worry about your 150 pound uh crewman you don't have to worry about all the gear that he's wearing his parachute uh the may west that he's carrying maybe a flare gun service pistol extra uh the the kit that you would have it's like if you have a, like a, a first aid kit whatnot that's also again of a of a different nature uh, so, for example, uh, this is a good cross section just to to sort of make that point. Um, your second crewman, your observer, your rear gunner, uh, that guy has to have a seat. He has to have armor that protects him in in these areas, uh, whether that's as a back plate or on side plates or or even like a front plate. Um, these are all necessary things to make sure that this gentleman survives. Um, yeah, and he also needs empty space, which is generally at a premium. Correct. And it doesn't want to be too far back because then that starts messing with the center of gravity. Mm -hmm. And the center of gravity hates you and wants to kill you if you get it too wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, there are a couple points I'd like to, to make mention. 
Um, one, mostly because I, I kind of skipped it earlier, uh, and and two, because I, I actually like this detail about this aircraft uh, that you kind of find in a, in a lot of naval, well, in at least some, some of the better uh, naval designs. Uh, one, the Ferry Fulmar Mark I is supposed to have a rear gunner. Finding an image of a rear, the rear gun actually in place and existing is, to me, to my abilities, nigh impossible. But there was one. Um, it it was generally a, a 303 caliber machine gun. Um, I don't think I've ever heard of stories of actual stories of the 50 cal being used. Um, but it had one rear gun, and I mean, let's face it, one 303 caliber rifle caliber stuff is not going to do too much. Um, it will d deter, but it will not uh, destroy. That that is uh, for sure. Um, and what's the mount look like? Because that greenhouse, I don't really see it having a brilliant fire arc, like more purpose-built ones with a sort of long tub-shaped cockpit where the rear gunner is at the end of it and can fire over a flat tail. So sadly, Mars tail is raised because of the relative uh, uniqueness of the the rear gun i don't actually have any information in in my manuals um if we if we look at say this photo um i believe that this portion kind of like the battle this portion is supposed to hinge upwards and the gun kind of gets stuck around here now i could be wrong and, and i'm likely to be wrong anyways in 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 that aspect because i i just could not find a, a single photo um the even this we can see like it's pointed to a couple items um dinghy stowage so this is where the dinghy is kept and that's uh that's typically one of the better ways to design your aircraft you see that on the um the wildcat especially if if, uh, if memory serves me correctly um but you got uh, some, you know, markers, storage, etc. Uh, you know, your second crewman is facing backwards, so arguably the 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 machine gun has to be around here and would be pointing uh, upwards. But well, obviously upwards. But at what angle and and what sort of area he's um, capable of covering is unknown to me because again uh no manual that i have uh has ever spoken of uh, of the rear gunner so getting back to this just like we got a, a really good idea of um where the dinghy is kept and uh it's interesting to see the um the actual exit that it's that is recommended um typically this sort of idea uh with your plane uh, flat and level is your dead stick landing or your your best kind of landing on water it doesn't really ever happen that way um if you're unlucky your plane flips over and whatnot but uh, if you actually do manage to to land a uh, cockpit up then uh, you're stepping out onto the wings so that you can get to you know you can get to the side reach reach your dinghy compartment pop out the dinghy and then uh, get in it and wait for an eventual uh, and hopeful rescue um a few last points uh i did mention that the full mar mark ii uh, did come out in uh, 1941 it was specifically january um but even in 1941 despite the increases to the full mars capabilities namely it's the speed and a little bit in, in terms of service ceiling and so on um it, it, the writing was on the wall the Fulmar never made any major production. Um, in total, it made about there was about 600 examples built, uh, 250 Mark Ones versus 350 Mark Twos. It's nothing to sneeze at, but it isn't something that really gets you in any of the record books. Um, when it comes to the Night Fighter variant, uh, that was never a, a separate production. The the only way to ever get night fighters was specifically by uh, converting either a Mark One or a Mark Two into a night fighter variant, um, because all you're really doing is adding uh, your radar and the the different functionality for the radar. You 
it doesn't matter which airframe it is. And at night, uh, the um, respective qualities for, say, uh, overall speed or turn radius, those sorts of things that a uh, more combat-centric aircraft uh, would be looking at, say, like the Zero and, and the 109, you don't really need to worry about that as much because, well, if you think driving in the darkness with your lights off is difficult, uh, try flying it where the only means of finding your target is by uh, a rather flimsy radar that shows one axis and you're hoping to see some blips um, on uh, on a rather uh, strange screen. But Yeah. Uh, Those t night fighters tended to get radio, uh, radar operators, so suddenly the second guy stops being a liability. Mm-hmm. At least to a pretty large degree. You also do get some later single-seat planes, but those are potentially a bit janky. Yeah, and the because of the fact that your your um, your dogfighting capabilities don't need to be as great as at night, then the semi resurgent of a two manned uh, fighter aircraft for night fighting purposes does not. Uh, is not as much like you said as a uh, of a liability. Um, the Fulmar again, despite having six hundred built, it's converted into night fighter variants. Uh, subsequent aircraft replace it. We'll see uh, in the future a couple of other designs by Ferry uh, that just supersede the Fulmar and relegate it to um, uh, second rate status. And by nineteen forty five. Uh, it gets retired from service. Uh, in fact, it doesn't even make it un until um, the victory in Asia. Uh, it gets removed, I believe, in July or, or very early August, but does not uh, does not survive till the end of the war. Which, uh, all things considered, for an aircraft that was designed mm, somewhat in 1934 mainly in 1938 and doesn't fly until 1940 uh, a five-year lifespan uh, is not um, is not the greatest um and yeah there's the the fulmar is just never quite able uh, even if you gave it the best engine in the world uh, it just doesn't overcome any deficiencies in the base design uh, and quietly gets shuffled off uh, into obscurity um, sadly for the, uh, the Ferry Fulmar, um, the company goes out of business, uh, decades later, but the Fulmar itself, um, I've, I forgot to mention this with, uh, in the last, uh, episode for its respective aircraft, but today only one of, uh, the Fulmars ever, uh, still exists. Um, I believe it's in a museum uh, for the Fleet Air Arm in the UK. I'm probably wrong on its exact location. Um, there's mentions that it's a Fulmar Mark I. However, it has the distinctive uh, intakes of the Fulmar Mark II. Not quite sure uh, if it's just a kit bash type idea or uh, what others would call a hack. Um, but uh, that ends up being the uh, the unfortunate end of uh, the fairy fulmar um the only other tidbit i can share uh is that there were plans uh for the fairy fulmar to be acquired by um a different nation one i was certainly not expecting um apparently plans were in motion for the danish navy to acquire fairy fulmars um but sadly for the company and i suppose the danish navy uh Plans were cut short after uh, Germany had started uh, openly declaring war um, over many of its uh, immediate neighbors. Uh, if uh, Mr. X, if you got any plugs, anything you want to shout out, um, if anybody's interested in, in several sources for the Fairy Fulmar, uh, these are some uh, rather great uh, uh, things to look into. Um, you have the floor on if you have any uh, topics you want to share. Uh, yeah, just with regards to how much weight matters, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the transition between the F4F-3 and the F4F-4. Sure. Uh, basically, the Dash 3 was lighter. You, know, you, you think more advanced. Okay, yeah, sure. 
there's a lot of planes in the run-up to World War II that they added some weight to, and everybody stopped liking those planes, like the Buffalo, apparently. Mm -hmm. Some people say the reason the Finns liked their Buffaloes and nobody else did was because the Finn Buffaloes were really lightweight and flew well, and the ones other people had were heavy and didn't do anything well. (laughs) Uh, So... The F4F-3 was the first variant to see mainline fleet service, and the Dash 4 was the next one based on the combat experience. Through a historical accident, the first uh, combat service it saw was the first combat experience it was based on was largely British, and they had an idea that four fifty cals wasn't going to cut it, so they added two guns to the wings mm-hmm. to make to make weight for that, they actually reduced the amount of bullets in the wings, which made some of the Navy pilots very incredibly mad. But I'm not going to focus on that. I'm going to focus on the weight gain. They also added self-sealing fuel tanks, which are one of those good things everybody likes, but they weigh pounds. And also they added folding wings, which was absolutely clutch. It meant that they could fit... Uh, 27 fighters where they previously had 18 fighters on a carrier and well the battle of coral sea had dauntlesses come back from scouting missions get fueled up uh loaded up with ammo and get told hey guys you know those zeros are fighters are having a hard time with try taking them on you got this pal this will go well it'll go well um, actually, one of the uh, more famous U.S. Navy pilots got his start in that fight, and congrats, Swede, you didn't die. Good job. <laughs> um, that is, to some degree, an accomplishment. But anyway, the F-4, F-4 lost about half its climb rate, among other things, with its weight increase, which is just like, oh, God, this actually materially influences our ability to make intercepts as well as the pilots all being incredibly mad that if they get into a Japanese bomber formation they aren't going to be able to make ace in a day because they have endless bullets for their machine guns Mm. Um, the amount of weight they added was uh, let's see 144 gallons fuel load which is uh, no external tanks it went from 7,556 pounds to 7,975 pounds. And mind reminding everybody how much the uh, Fulmar weighed? Uh, The Fulmar weighed a lovely 10,200 pounds as a maximum weight. Yeah. So... The Wildcats flight characteristics got materially impacted by going up uh, 419 pounds, Hmm. which is okay. So that's that's an idea of how much weight increase you're dealing with. And for reference, the engine on these things, on the uh, Wildcats was rated for 1100 horsepower normal and 1200 military. So it's not that far off the Merlin, if I remember right. Yeah, not that far. We're looking yeah, so. Yeah, just sheer size. And also, this is the Wildcat. This is not notorious for being a light, super agile plane already. And having another guy is a lot of complexity. So, I mean, they it very well could be a perfectly good airplane that did about as well as it could do but the design was going to come off poorly in daytime dogfights from the second they wrote down the specification yeah and thankfully the way that the ferry company ended up uh doing its specifications and and entering in in different uh, projects and competitions we will eventually see i guess better versions of the fulmar but I gotta keep. Uh, we have to keep our, our audience in suspense at least a little bit. So, um, unless there's anything else uh, you want to add, uh, I will bid uh, each and every one of you viewers adieu. 
Uh, thanks for listening and watching, and stick around until next time for uh, another crazy or maybe mundane, not so great or fantastic aircraft. That's pretty much it on my end. Perfect. So, again, without any further ado, take care. <laughs>